Hey everybody, welcome to OK Talks. I'm your host, Oliver Kendall. In case you haven't heard the brief three-minute introductory episode where I lay out in a little bit more detail who I am and what it is that I'm hoping to do with this podcast, I'm a lifelong political nerd with a background in international relations and security policy who's worked for a number of democratic campaigns and liberal political organizations. I've also spent a decent bit of time traveling and living outside of the United States, which has put me in a good position to shed light for my American audience on some events of note going on outside the country and to explain to some of my foreign listeners some of the insanity that characterizes American politics these days. Speaking of insanity, in my previous episode, I discussed inherent disparities in America in terms of how we handle right-wing versus left-wing protesters and the potential threat to democracy represented by a small group of armed right-wing protesters that we increasingly see in America. In this episode, I'm going to be discussing a different threat to democracy, one that comes from one of our very own political parties. Despite the best efforts of America's founders, political parties have been a critical part of our democracy almost as long as the U.S. has existed. For better or worse, and having now spent time living in multi-party parliamentary democracies, I would definitely say worse, the American governmental structure unintentionally favors a two-party system, which means realistically that since the mid-1800s, American politics has been defined as a struggle between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Although that's still the case today, increasingly I think it makes more and more sense to think of American politics not so much as defined by a struggle between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but as a struggle between the Democrats and the anti-Democrats. Now, if I'd said that at any point over the last decade or so, it would have made sense as a joking reference to the fact that the modern Republican Party doesn't really seem to have much of a stand for ideologically other than reflexively opposing everything the Democrats do. They're not really an ideology-based political party so much as they are the Democrats' crazy ex. Witness the way they spent the entire Obama presidency calling the Affordable Care Act a one-stop train to Stalinism and then once they had unified control of government under President Trump, were unable to repeal it or do anything about it because they hadn't actually bothered to think of an alternative. Thus, the party's been defined largely by just being anti-the Democrats. Nowadays, though, calling the Republicans the anti-Democrats takes on a much more sinister connotation, as the party increasingly seems to be at war with the very concept of democracy itself. They're not just anti-the Democrats, they're anti-small-d democracy. Now, to be fair, America's always been at least somewhat a flawed democracy. The Electoral College, for example, is stupid. And the Senate, God, think about this. One person from California, in terms of their representative power in the Senate, is worth 155th of a person from Wyoming. That's crazy. That makes me feel so bad for, for Californians that I'm almost inclined to skip my obligatory reference to them being terrible drivers. The Senate, as it is today is an affront to the idea of representative democracy, and the framers clearly did not anticipate a situation where the relative population sizes of states would grow so, uh, so widely disparate in the future. But I can yell about the Senate some other time. Hey, at least now, as of 100 years ago, American citizens actually do get to vote for their senators rather than having them picked by a state legislature. Speaking of voting, and back to my original point, one of the other flaws in America's history of democracy has been who was and was not allowed to participate in it. Initially, for example, only white men who owned land were allowed to vote in America. The struggle to extend voting rights to more people, first black men, then women, people under 21, has been slow, way too slow. But probably with the exception of the end of Reconstruction in the South, for the most part, the trend has been in the direction of having more people, not fewer people, have the right to vote in America. It's been a long, winding journey, but the general direction has been toward more, not less, democracy. Over the last couple of years, I've largely, at least in public, avoided hyperbole and casually throwing around words like authoritarian or fascist to describe Republicans and certainly Donald Trump. But at this moment, our very concept of democracy is in unique peril, both in terms of our ability to participate in decision-making through voting in elections, and in terms of the likelihood of Republicans to abide by the decisions made by the people who did vote in elections. There's a broader conversation to be had about very real, very problematic structural threats to our democracy, like the ones I mentioned before in the form of the Electoral College and the Senate, and some that I didn't, like gerrymandering. But in this episode, I want to talk specifically 
about the direct threat being posed by the Republicans to democracy in this upcoming election, both in terms of attacking participation in the election and in terms of the possibility that the Republicans, or at least Donald Trump, might ignore its results. I'll get to that very scary possibility along with, apologies, my terrible Trump impression at the end of the episode. I'm going to resist the urge to go on a soliloquy about the history of voter suppression in America, but suffice it to say that the concept of screwing with the other party's ability to turn out voters is not exactly unheard of. That being said, though, the modern Republican Party really does seem to have made voter suppression a central component in their electoral strategy, and they've elevated keeping people who are likely to vote Democratic from voting to almost an art form. It's worth noting that the Republicans have been aided and abetted in this by the fact that back in 2013, the right-wing majority on the Supreme Court absolutely trashed the Voting Rights Act. Judges matter, folks, which is why I'd like here and now to facetiously thank all the purists in 2016 who refused to vote for Hillary for Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. But I digress. One of the ways the Republican Party has figured out that they can suppress the vote is by passing at the state level laws that force voters to show a photo ID before being given a ballot. Now, in an argument that only lasts a couple of seconds, this is a really easy sell. People should have to prove who they are. But if the debate lasts a little bit longer, it usually starts to become clear that the arguments in favor of voter ID laws are less than genuine. A comprehensive study reported in the Washington Post of more than a billion ballots cast since the year 2000 found of that more than a billion, 31 credible instances of voter fraud. This would indicate that voter ID laws are really nothing more than an expensive solution to a problem that doesn't exist. But maybe actually it is a solution to a different problem, the problem from the Republicans' perspective of too many Americans being allowed to vote. According to the ACLU, for example, millions of Americans, at least 11% of U.S. citizens, don't actually have government-issued photo IDs. That comes even more into focus when you look at who that 11% of the American people are. According again to the ACLU, up to 25% of African Americans don't have photo IDs, whereas that number is only 8% for white people. Think about it. Who in America is the most likely to not have a driver's license? People that are too poor to own a car, people who live right in the middle of big cities and thus don't need a car, and older folks from the New Deal generation. None of those are exactly core constituencies of the modern Republican Party. Also, according again to the ACLU, up to 25% of black people in America don't have photo IDs, whereas that number is only about 8% for white people. It's even more clear that this is done with bad intentions when you look at what kinds of IDs certain states' laws will accept versus ones they reject. In Texas, for example, you can use a gun permit to vote, but you can't use a student ID. Bottom line, voter ID laws drive down voter turnout among low-income people, students, minorities, and the elderly. Check and mate. In addition to throwing up hurdles in the form of voter ID laws that make it harder for people to vote, Republican elected officials, particularly the secretaries of state in various states, have also limited turnout by conducting massive purges of the voter rolls, which is to say basically looking at who is registered to vote, seeing who skipped an election or two, and just basically erasing their name from the line. This has increasingly been happening under Republican secretaries of state, but it seems to be becoming more and more brazen. In 2018, for example, the current governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, was the secretary of state in Georgia and purged hundreds of thousands of people from the voter rolls for an election in which he was a candidate, which he then barely won by, by the way, far fewer votes than he had purged from the voter rolls. I'm going to skip the details, but if you're not familiar with this story, Google Brian Kemp voter purge. It'll curl your hair. Republican elected officials have also become increasingly brazen in their willingness to limit where and when people can vote. It seems just about every election now, we're treated to a barrage of pictures of endless lines outside polling stations and stories of hours long waits to simply cast a ballot, a problem which seems to be uniquely acute in urban areas, particularly minority neighborhoods, in states where Republican elected officials are in some way responsible for running the election. We are long past the point where we can continue to pretend that this is by accident. My favorite, most egregious, ridiculous example of this was Dodge City, Kansas in 2018, which is a majority Latino community, which for some reason already only had one single polling place, which is nuts when you consider the population size. And then in 2018, a couple months before the election, that one polling place was moved 
somewhere outside the city to a place that was not accessible by public transportation. Ostensibly, it was moved because of construction in, like, the parking lot next door or something, but as far as I know, that was not actually the case. When the ACLU sent a letter to the county clerk asking that they open another polling place, the county clerk forwarded the letter to state officials with the comment, LOL. I'm also pretty sure that the person she forwarded that letter to would have been Kansas's Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who is one of the single worst people in Republican politics, a pioneer in voter suppression who is now, by the way, running for Senate in Kansas. So if I have any listeners in Kansas, be sure and vote this year. Although the Dodge City example is probably the most egregious one, it's hardly unique. There's been a number of stories about a mysterious lack of polling places anywhere near historically black colleges and universities, particularly in the South, and in general, the distinct lack of uh, places to vote in urban minority-heavy areas in states that are controlled by Republicans continues to be a pretty obvious problem that really doesn't look like an accident. In addition to limiting where people can vote, Republican elected officials have continued to try to throw up obstacles as to when people can vote. In states with early voting, there's become a tradition uh, of black churches organizing events called Souls to the Polls, which used to say on Sunday after church, the church will organize a bunch of vans and take a bunch of people to all go and vote together after the church service. In certain states, there have, for some reason, been efforts to end early voting on Sundays specifically. Subtle. In addition to restricting where and when people can vote, Republicans have made serious efforts to limit how people can vote. When President Trump nominated then-Montana Congressman Ryan Zinke to be the Secretary of Interior, he, like so many other cabinet secretaries, would resign amidst a massive corruption scandal a little while later, Montana had to have an election to refill his congressional seat. Some Montana officials, since they just spent a ton of money on the federal election of 2016, suggested that they have an election done entirely by mail-in ballots, which would have saved money. But unfortunately, the Montana Republican Party figured that this might lead to more people voting, which might... Uh, make it more likely that the Democrat would beat their candidate, Greg Jean Forde, who had gained national attention when he body-slammed a reporter for asking him a question they didn't like. So the state of Montana had an in-person election, which cost way more money, but the Republican won, so worth it. More recently, the Republican Party, and especially President Trump, have just gone absolutely to war with the concept of absentee voting, but I'll get to that in a minute. Beyond the aforementioned efforts to limit where, when, and how people can vote in the United States, the right has increasingly stepped up creepy, more-in-your-face efforts to discourage people from wanting to vote, especially in areas that have a lot of voters who they think are likely to not be voting with them. Increasingly during recent election cycles, mysterious billboards with unknown origins have been appearing in largely poor minority neighborhoods, with uh, friendly reminders that voter fraud is illegal and spelling out the various severe legal penalties for attempting to commit voter fraud, all of which clearly has the effect of creating an air of fear and potential risk around going to vote. Working to further complicate voting, the Republicans have also hired an army of poll watchers to hang around polling places and randomly challenge the ballots of people that they decide are suspicious. That effort reportedly is being massively stepped up this year. In addition to the official poll watchers, how much do you want to bet that this fall, in a number of states that have open carry laws, the same creepy armed to the teeth right wing protesters that I talked about in the last episode will be patrolling in minority heavy areas dressed in full military fatigues on election day? Hardly seems beyond the realm of possibility. And I can just hear right now somebody saying, well, what does this matter? In an open carry state, it is legal to carry your gun around, but it's not legal to shoot somebody necessarily, so people who want to go vote have nothing to fear. But let's be realistic. The two disgusting, redneck, wannabe cop, racist, cave-dwelling mouth breathers in Georgia who murdered Ahmaud Aubrey in broad daylight almost got away with it and did for months. People have a legitimate reason to be afraid of heavily armed white civilians roaming around, on election day, and anyone says this wouldn't discourage people from voting or impact the results of an election, is either comically naive or being disingenuous. All of this creepy, ridiculous, subversive, anti-democratic nonsense was already in place before I even mentioned the Republicans' new ace in the hole, the ultimate vote suppressor, COVID-19. Even if the Trump administration's response to the pandemic had been aggressively competent as opposed to, tragically, specifically not that, 
it would still be likely that the 2020 election would be conducted under a second wave of the coronavirus. Having to wait in a long line before being given a piece of paper touched by multiple people and then entering a small enclosed voting booth recently vacated by a guy in a MAGA hat who refused to wear a mask and coughed everywhere, and then filling out your ballot with a pen used by 150 different people in the last hour before being given an I Voted sticker by some poor retiree volunteering as a poll worker <sighs> are just a few of the obvious dangers associated with voting in person in the context of a deadly upper respiratory pandemic ripping its way across the country. Given those obvious risks of forcing everybody to show up and vote in person, you'd think almost everybody would be able to get behind the idea of exploring safer alternatives for the election this fall, right? Wrong, of course. The Republicans have opposed virtually any efforts proposed by the Democrats to come up with different ways that we can vote in the context of the pandemic. And, as far as I'm aware, have proposed none of their own. Republicans forced the citizens of Wisconsin and Georgia to vote in person during recent primaries in those states. The fact that the elections happened during peak coronavirus transmission periods, combined with pre-existing Republican shenanigans to make voting in those states more difficult, caused those elections to be complete debacles. In Georgia, a large number of new voting machines provided by a buddy of that state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, simply didn't work. And in Wisconsin's most diverse city, Milwaukee, only five polling places were open. Both states' primaries generated hundreds of infuriating images and news stories of voters being forced to wait hours surrounded by other people simply to cast their ballots. The primary in Wisconsin gave us the comically tone-deaf video of one of that state's highest-ranking Republican lawmakers wearing what amounted to a hazmat suit, looking straight into the camera and swearing up and down to voters that it was completely safe to wait in line to vote. Evidently, he forgot that video cameras are the ones where people can see you. Rather than being embarrassed by these problems and trying to do a better job in November, though, Republicans are actively doing the opposite. In Iowa, one of the states that actually pulled off a pretty successful primary recently, Republicans in that state Senate have recently passed a law that specifically forbids that state's Secretary of State from doing the thing that he did that worked this time in November. When state-level elected Republicans have been unable to undermine attempts to increase vote-by-mail in the context of the pandemic, Trump and the Republicans at the national level have swung hard to try and intimidate those states out of doing things to make the election safer this fall. Michigan's Secretary of State, who, like the one in Iowa, sent out applications for absentee ballots, was on the receiving end of a tweet storm from Trump, and the state of California is currently being sued by the Republican Party to try and stop them from having an all-mail-in election this November. Trump has actually been pretty open about why it is that he doesn't want to allow more Americans the opportunity to vote by mail. In the context of a number of the coronavirus bills being considered before Congress, many of which included provisions to increase options for voting safely, Trump has publicly fretted that the increased turnout that would result will cause him to lose the election, because nothing says greatness like, I'm afraid of people voting. Besides Trump saying the quiet part out loud, as he so often does, it's worth noting that the less nakedly partisan arguments made by more serious Republicans are also complete, let's say, malarkey. Republican fear-mongering about mail-in voter fraud in an attempt to suppress absentee voting is just as baseless as Republican fear-mongering about in-person voter fraud as an attempt to justify voter ID laws to suppress in-person voting. In states like Utah, Washington, and Oregon, where they have almost universal vote by mail, there's no evidence of widespread or even limited voter fraud. In fact, the only example in modern times of any sort of fraud when it comes to vote by mail was when a Republican operative in North Carolina a couple of years ago sent operatives around to fool old people into giving them their ballots rather than sending them in for a local congressional election. That the president and a number of his key spokespeople would so directly attack the very idea of absentee voting, when many of them, including Trump, are known to vote by mail themselves, is hypocritical, sure, but hypocrisy is par for the course in the modern Republican Party. This specific example of it could be something a whole lot scarier. We've been talking up until now about the ways in which Republicans are seeking to impede democracy through voter suppression. Efforts to delegitimize the very idea of absentee voting could be part of an attempt to ignore democracy entirely by creating a pretext to reject the results of the 2020 election if it doesn't go their way. You might remember, Trump already back in 2016 started laying the groundwork for the possibility that he might someday ignore an election. 
In addition to his typical whining about media bias, he alleged that the whole process was rigged against him and that there was some kind of conspiracy, but he promised that he would totally accept the results of the election if he won. Many were reasonably horrified that Trump would say something so fundamentally disrespectful of our democratic process. But a lot of people laughed it off and didn't take him seriously. That was a grave error then, and would be an even more deadly mistake to make this time around. Sure, Trump came out the other day and said that he would abide by the results of the election, but I would argue that among historical figures, Donald Trump is uniquely likely to be the person that rejects the results of an election and sends our democracy into a tailspin. Trump has a long history of rejecting objective facts when they are in any way unpleasant to him, and, critically, of causing the people around him to live under the same set of alternative facts, to borrow a phrase. Remember when the real reason Hillary won the popular vote by 3 million was because millions of quote illegals unquote voted in the election? Or when President Trump had the most bigly inauguration crowd in history, maybe ever, period? Or when Hurricane Sharpie took out Alabama? Yeah, me either. But if you watch Fox News and OANN religiously and follow Trump's Twitter feed, you might. If Trump and his supporters are able to convince themselves of those easily disprovable things, you know, besides convincing themselves that Trump's head is covered with natural blonde hair and not the tragic result of a horrifically botched experimental scalp replacement surgery carried out by a mad scientist, it shouldn't be that hard for them to convince themselves that Joe Biden didn't really kick Trump's ass in an election, if that is in fact what ends up happening. In addition to his rejection of basic objective fact, President Trump has demonstrated an almost boundless disregard for the rule of law. If I tried to list even just the most obvious examples, I'd have to pause multiple times for bathroom breaks. But setting aside all the corruption and self-dealing and attempts to go after his perceived political enemies, let's think about just in the context of his disregard for the rules governing elections. From Russia, if you're listening, I hope you can help us find Hillary's missing emails. To Hello, new Ukrainian president. I'd love to send you the military aid promised to you by our Congress to fight off the invasion. But first, I'd like you to do us a favor, though. Trump has demonstrated a complete willingness to ask foreign governments to interfere in American elections to benefit him. And that was before we even found out the other day from John Bolton's book that he'd asked the Chinese president to do the same. There are countless examples of Trump ignoring basic provable fact and the rule of law when either make him at all uncomfortable. Nothing else has proven sacred to this man. Why is it that we think that this behavior would change suddenly in the context of an election? especially when he's demonstrated an almost pathological revulsion for the idea of losing something. After several years of a presidency whose defining characteristic, besides, of course, self-enrichment and a rejection of the spellcheck function, has been the willingness to abuse power, I think we need to look at the response to Black Lives Matter protests over the last couple of weeks, especially the ones in D.C., as a dress rehearsal for a potential challenge to the election this fall if Trump is declared the loser. Viewed in those terms, the already fairly scary actions taken by the administration over the last couple of weeks become a whole lot scarier. Now, let's think for a second just about the military. Trump already spent his entire presidency shamelessly undermining the nonpartisan nature of the military, and although they've made disapproving noises about it sometimes, they've largely put up with it. In fairness to the relatively new chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, he has apologized for the role he played in the president's photo op, holding a Bible upside down in front of a church, which required the beating and gassing of a park full of peaceful protesters. But only after the mistreatment of the protesters received harsh condemnation from a number of former chairs of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former Defense Secretary and retired General James Mattis. We didn't get quite to the point of deploying active duty U.S. soldiers to the streets to fight protesters. We left that to the National Guard. But we got pretty damn close. Sure, the fairly weak Secretary of Defense condemned the idea of deploying soldiers against the American people for like a second, but then squeaked like a puppy whose tail had been stepped on the minute the White House press secretary dangled his job in front of him on live TV. So if Trump this November decides that he was going to ignore the outcome of an election, would the military finally start resisting his abuses of power, or would they fall in line? And besides the military... How are we supposed to interpret the sudden arrival of a bunch of mysterious armed guys in D.C. who wore no uniforms, insignia, nameplates, or any sort of identification? Setting aside the fact that having unaccountable paramilitary forces is a hallmark of authoritarian regimes, from a more practical standpoint, if you can't identify any of these people, 
Who are you supposed to go and talk to if one of them shoots your friend or beats you up or something when you are protesting peacefully? Furthermore, although we found out later that these people were basically a hodgepodge of federal agents taken from various other law enforcement agencies that don't usually do law enforcement, in the moment, if they refuse to identify, how the hell are people supposed to know that they actually even have any authority? Especially at a time where it's particularly common for armed right-wingers to show up to protests playing military dress-up. How are you supposed to know that these people have any actual authority and are not just some local kooky militia, or maybe a PMC or something? So then, given that over the last couple of weeks, a number of different parts of the federal government and a number of local police departments didn't exactly behave in a way that inspired confidence in their desire to stand up for democracy in the face of a potential authoritarian leader. If Trump refuses to go after losing an election in November, do we know who will get him out of there? Again, although the military, especially former, made some noises of disapproval, they kind of fell in line. What about some Republican senators? They still believe in democracy, right? If Trump lost the election and then refused to leave, they'd tell him to go away, wouldn't they? Pause for laughter. Well, Senator Tom Cotton wrote an op-ed saying we should deploy the 82nd Airborne to fight protesters. And even before all of this, during the impeachment process, when every single one of them, except maybe the stupidest Republican member of the Senate looking at you, James Inhofe, knew damn well that Trump had committed impeachable offenses, only one of them was able to find the guts to vote to convict him. And that was when they knew he'd be succeeded by Mike Pence, someone with whom they apparently have a lot more in common ideologically than Trump. No. Mitt Romney saying that Black Lives Matter and a concerned tweet from Susan Collins can't possibly fool us into thinking that Republican senators will save our democracy from Trump in November if it comes down to that. Okay, so then let's play this out. It's 11.15 p.m. on November 3rd. CNN and MSNBC have just called the election for Biden. Trump tweets, The mainstream media, led by fake news CNN and MSDNC, is saying that I lost the election. Totally biased. Sad. 45 minutes later, Fox begrudgingly claws the election for Biden, though Hannity and Ingram say it shouldn't count because California isn't really America, so they shouldn't be allowed to vote in the first place. Breitbart and OANN, meanwhile, put out stories claiming millions of, quote, Latino illegals, unquote, voted in Arizona and Texas, and alleging reports of thousands of dead people voting in Detroit and Philadelphia. An hour after the mainstream sources have called the election, and after Stephen Miller has had time to print out the Breitbart story and show it to Trump, Trump puts out a heavily misspelled tweet saying, Hearing lots of stories of illegals voting bigly in our great election, vote hair fraud. 30 minutes later, Trump tweets, Due to the widespread reports of illegal voting in our great swing states, I will not concede the election to the do-nothing Dems and sleepy Joe Biden until dot 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 my great Attorney General William Barr can conduct a full investigation to figure out what the hell is going on. An hour after that, Trump tweets calls for his great supporters to protect their Second Amendment rights by showing up at precincts and their Secretary of State's offices to show their support for your favorite president. So, what happens then? Maybe there isn't violence in the street from thousands of armed Trump supporters, and there is some sort of investigation, which then proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Trump lost, and he then just spends the transition period rage-tweeting and pardoning everyone who committed crimes for him while cold-calling the leaders of countries with good golf courses and no extradition treaties, provided, of course, he's unable to preemptively pardon himself. Or maybe something scarier happens. Maybe Trump continues to reject the results of the election, and then what? Is he physically removed from office on Inauguration Day and taken into custody for impeding the peaceful transition of power? Or does the Secret Service stand by him, flanked by the shadowy group of unidentified law enforcement officers assembled by Bill Barr to attack protesters these last couple of weeks? I don't know. But we're kidding ourselves if we don't think this is a real possibility. I'm alarmed by how many Democratic politicians who, when asked, first by the great comedian Bill Maher and then by everyone else, about the possibility of Trump rejecting the results of the election, respond with some iteration of, well, we just have to win big so we can't deny the results. He lost by more than 3 million votes and with the help of a foreign adversary in 2016 and still got to be the president. I am so sick and tired of Democrats being held to a different standard. But I sure as hell hope that someone, 
who is a lot smarter than me and with a much better understanding of the military and law enforcement structures in the United States, has a contingency plan to force a relatively peaceful transition of power. Because I fear that the several weeks after the election, which, by the way, will probably all be happening under a second wave of COVID-19, could be the most perilous our democracy has faced since 1860. Sleep tight! That's it for this episode of OK Talks. If you like the podcast so far, please subscribe and think about leaving a review or sharing it. If you really don't like it, then hey, share it with somebody you hate. Ruin their day. As always, I'd like to thank my friend Nate Wright for his technical advice and for having designed the podcast artwork. I hope everybody's staying relatively safe, healthy, and sane during these crazy times. And until the next episode, thanks for listening.